Good morning, church family. It is good to be in the house of the Lord today, amen? Amen. It's great to see so many smiling faces out there. I have a praise. I just want to praise the Lord for giving me health, for giving me purpose, for giving me understanding. I just want to praise his name. Let us pause for prayer. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, once again we are humbly here before you in your house of worship. Lord, Heavenly Father, open up our hearts, open up our minds, give us an ample supply of the Holy Spirit that leads to understanding. Lord, Heavenly Father, be it your words that pass through these lips this morning, not my own. Heavenly Father, in your Son's name, Jesus Christ, amen. Today's study, the mirror of God, is it real or is it counterfeit? How do we see it? How do we define it? When God breathed the breath of life into man's nostrils, he was giving his spirit to him. What other name did the Holy Spirit acquire in the book of Luke? Jesus said in Luke 11:20, But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt that the kingdom of God has come upon you. And also Matthew 12:28. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. In the creation of man, when God was breathing the Holy Spirit, he was at the same time writing something upon man. And scripture qualifies that God breathed, or in this case, wrote something into his nostrils to give that man life. Interestingly, the word nostrils in Hebrew is A-P-H, af, which translates to face or forehead. The Bible reveals in the process of creation a profoundness of God's endeavor. God made man in his own what? Image. 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 Something he placed into his nostrils to give man life was the gift of God, his character. He put that into man. He wrote it. The Bible reveals in the process of creation that this was his character. Genesis 1, 26, 27. God engraved his law upon man's forehead. God wrote his law with his finger through the Holy Spirit in the mind of man. Indeed, this is powerful. It reveals to us today that God's law was never an afterthought. It was not something exclusive to the Jews later on. It wasn't exclusive to them. You, you that hear this message are as Psalms 139, 14 states, fearfully and wonderfully made. You are a marvelous work. And by these words, your soul knows right well. You can feel what the Holy Spirit placed in your heart today has come from the beginning of time. Nothing has changed. God's law, God's word never changes. After the fall, the purpose of God still remains unchanged. He wants today a new creation, a recreation, if you will. He wants us transformed into his own image. It was God's agenda from the beginning and remains constant to this very day. God does not change. Hebrews ten sixteen. This is the covenant I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and into their minds. I will write them. 
Do you feel that today? Do you hear that today? Is it in your mind? Is it written in your mind today? With his own spirit, God wants to reunite our hearts and minds once again to his law. He wants to make us new creatures. He wants to restore his image in you and me and restore his purity, righteousness, perfection, and the love that man held in his heart at the time of creation. If God's image is also his law, then Satan's final attack will be like the former and counteract the divine work of God in man. Revelation thirteen fifteen. And he had the power to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. That's a possibility. Notice here how the image of the beast receives life as if Satan had the power that is only God's prerogative. This is a false attempt to counterfeit God's creation of man. Satan will try to offer humanity a new creation, a new image, an illusion of new birth that has a mask of piety, but will deny the work of transformation. Let's come along now and let's meet the counterfeit. 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For man shall be lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those who are good. They will be traitors heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such persons we must stay away. Now let's be careful. The lie begins by deceiving people to believe that this new purpose, proposal of sanctity is the work of the Creator God. But whosoever is not in harmony with this new agenda, its laws or image will be persecuted and killed. John sixteen two, they shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever kills you will think that he doeth God's service. It's tough to stand up, isn't it? It's hard to stand on the rock of Jesus. The second commandment clearly tells us in Exodus 25. Thou shalt not bow down to thyself to them nor serve them. For I the Lord thy God am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. The book of Daniel reveals clearly by illustration what is to be considered worship conflict. As the king Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had built a huge statue. Now we're all familiar with this story, are we not? He built a huge statue, signifying his greatness. All subjects from the realm were commanded to appear and pay special homage to his greatness by bowing down to worship this pagan image on a special time as commanded, and I will paraphrase a lot of this. There it was taking place on the vast plain of Dura. Daniel 3, 4 to 6. It was cried out loudly, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. And who so fall not down and worship shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. 
Now, just for representation of what the king proposed to do, if you do not bow down, he had built a huge fiery furnace. It was no joke. There it was. All could see. Among the thousands of would-be worshipers, there were three who would not discredit their faith. And, of course, as everybody bowed down, they certainly stood out in this crowd because they were the ones not bowing down. They were quickly called out as dissidents by the pagan followers and directed to come over to the king. The Israeli lads, which Babylon renamed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, knew full well about God's law and that it was everlasting. It was a covenant with his people, and they believed that not even the greatest world empire could change all that. They did not bow and now stood in the crosshairs of condemnation. They took the high ground, stood with the Lord, and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not concerned to answer thee in this matter, If it be so, our God, whom we serve, can deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from out of thine hand. O king, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that will not serve, we shall not serve your gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up on the plain. That was pretty bold, wasn't it? Pretty bold of them. Think you could do that? Hmm? Think you could do that? The lads stood their ground and claimed God's promise. That is in Deuteronomy 31.6. Be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that goes with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Amen? Amen. How, how, oh, how, the king was amazed and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire. They have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Revelations 1, 2. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, holding, having the harps of God. That's where I want to be. How about you? But there's a lot coming before us, isn't there? And it's unraveling at an unheard speed, right before our eyes. Prophecy is being fulfilled. With all this in mind and victory at hand, the true meaning of the image of the beast becomes clear. Without a doubt, with all the things that are going on before us today, a counterfeit law is before us and will polarize the world with bad intent. And it will come as... It will be stated as, it will be disguised as, what is good for all mankind? We will be forced to decide for or, for or against a decision regarding whom we will worship and on what day and at what time. At this point, our loyalty will be tested and we should look in the mirror, friends. Who do you see in the mirror? Do you see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Or are you still undecided as to what you will do about the fiery furnace that will be placed before us? I'm going to segue just a little bit. I have a dear friend. Her name is Yolanda. And she always calls me on the phone. She's a, she's a business associate. She lives in California. Her name is Yolanda Gonzalez. And she's always telling me about her dreams. 
She's always telling me about the people she meets. She also tells me about what she says to the people. Her agenda is that she hopes that the good Lord puts in front of her someone each and every day that she can minister to, that she can talk about Jesus and what he has done for her. So the other day she calls me up. She goes, oh, Larry, I got, had this dream and I got to tell you this dream. Got to tell you this dream. She goes, it was, it was a day I just didn't want to get out of bed, but I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I said, no, I'm, not, I'm going back to sleep. So she goes back to sleep and she has this dream. She has this dream. And in this dream, she says, I see... A pair of shoes. I'm getting out of bed and I see these pair of shoes. They're my shoes. They're dusty. They're dirty. They're filthy. They're filled with little pebbles and they're filled with dirt. And I thought, what is this? These are my shoes. She goes, but surrounding those shoes, I see green leaves. Bright green leaves. Vegetation. These green leaves. But there's my shoes. So I wake up. I'm thinking, what's this all about? She goes, and I think, I think, I think about biblical scripture. She goes, and suddenly I think about Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8. Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8. Let's go there real quick. What does it say? What does it say there? It says in 7, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters and that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Huh. What about that? What does it say? It says, if you travel, she take it as if I travel the path of unrighteousness. I shall constantly be walking in dust and dirt and the filth of the world. But if I put my trust and my faith in the Lord, I'll be as this tree beside the waters. My, my roots will go down into the what? The living waters. I will be blessed by those living waters and I'll take in these fruits or the the water and I will bear fruit. Doesn't that make sense? Makes sense to me. Anyway, that's Yolanda. She always calls me up. Not to sell me groceries because that's what I do most of the time. She sells me groceries from California. But every once in a while, she puts this little, these little things in. What a blessing, huh? What a blessing. Where was I? James 2. Let's go to James 2, 22 to 25. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a bearer or a hearer of the world and not a doer, He is like unto man beholding his natural face in a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Hmm. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. What James is reflecting here is he looks into the law of God and it is the same as looking into a mirror. His purpose is to find a reflection. The law is a transcript of the character of God. That means that when we look at this mirror of the law of God, we should not see our own image, but rather the image of Jesus, his character, his glory, his name, his purity, his perfection, and his love. That's what we should be transformed into. How far are we from the divine? Christ should be our example. 
His glory, name, image, character, and law are one and the same. They refer to Jesus. Therefore, when we look at the law of God, it should be written on our hearts, and we should be looking at Jesus Christ himself as a representation as to what we need to become. If we read this book, if we read about Jesus Christ, and if we believe in his name and his deeds, that should be our reflection as we walk daily through our lives. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Ecclesiastes 1, 2 to 4. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? One generation passes away, another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Is there profit in that? And I have to admit, week by week, day by day, what do I do? I chase after the almighty dollar. I do that. I sell products by the trailer load to the Amish and Mennonites. Groceries, health and beauty aids, because within the Amish and Mennonite communities, they have their own bent and dent stores. You know, have you ever been into an Ollie's? or a save lots, or any of those places. Well, the Amish, within their own communities, have their own stores. And they all buy from each other, you know. They, that's what they do. And I very rarely sell to the English. Why? Why don't I like selling to the English? Well, for one thing, their money's no good. They promise to pay. And I have been so much hurt financially because of whom I trust. We have to know who we trust. We have to recognize who we trust. And those people that trust us have to know that we're good too. World, the world I have, I have built on trust. But there's only one that I know that I can trust. Amen. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. When we talk about mirroring the image of Christ, this has nothing to do with our vanity. People use mirrors for many things. But according to the Gospels, a mirror should not be used for vanity. We should establish that the law of God is the mirror of God's character. How can we make sense of the use of these biblical definitions? Let's say we have a lady. And this is a beautiful, beautiful young lady in all ways, shapes, and forms. But yet, even her beauty, this particular lady, she looks at herself in a mirror and guess what she sees? She condemns herself. She doesn't see her beauty and she hates what she sees. So to fix the problem, what does she do? She tries to forcefully change the image in the mirror. She puts on jewelry. But she puts on makeup. She dyes her hair. And then she looks back in the mirror. But wait a minute. That's not enough. I've got to put tattoos on myself because I don't look how I don't I like the way I look. So she puts tattoos on herself. She believes she can make the image more perfect than what it already is. Makeup, jewelry, tattoos. The woman is never satisfied. 
She believes the image can keep changing according to her own desires. Hmm. The old image of perfection, the one that God created, has totally been removed. And now the woman represents a beast. She is an abomination. The woman thinks she can change the image, but it is impossible because God's image cannot be changed. We know that in Bible prophecy that a woman represents God's church. And in Genesis, God is explaining to Satan and explaining that his punishment is due to his deception. This is the first place that God refers to his church as a woman. Genesis 3.15 And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel God is referencing his heel as we know that this is the coming of Jesus Christ the Lord and the Savior the book of Revelation also speaks about another woman who was also wanting to change the image of God so here in the symbolism it points us to the church that thinks it's possible to change the image of God A church that will attempt to change the perfect laws of God. To change God's perfect character. Joseph Heller wrote a book called Catch-22 in my day, and it was required reading. It was published in 1961. I was 11 years old back then. Uh Uh-oh. Now you know how old I am. There was a poem in the book of black parody, and that's what it was. And it goes like this. Just listen to the words. It was miraculous. It was almost no trick at all, he saw. To turn vice into virtue. To change slander into truth. To change impotence into abstinence, to change arrogance into humility, to change plunder into philanthropy, thievery into honor, blasphemy into wisdom, brutality into patriotism, and sadism into justice. Now here's the punchline. He said, anybody can do it. It requires no brains at all. It merely requires no character. No character. What's happening around us today? What's happening to truth? The things that we place into our hearts. All around us, these changes are taking place on all truths. Daniel 7.25 And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given unto his hand until a time and times and a dividing of times. In this verse, Daniel tells us about a religious power or church that will take on the task of changing what is impossible to change. He shall think to change times and the law. He shall think to change God's character. Revelation 17, 4 to 5. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the great harlots and abominations of the earth. The mother of harlots. This is a corrupt church which does not like the appearance she sees in the mirror of God. She knows that all she represents Her abominations, sins, filthiness, and corruptions are condemned by the mirror of God. 
She will attempt to use the mirror of God for her own vanity. It is a violation of the third commandment. Thou shall have no other gods before me. The unchangeable law of God cannot be changed, and by attempting to do so, she becomes a beast. Only a beast can live without a moral law. Since his time in heaven, Satan has tried to change the moral law, which is to say change the characters of God. And the the character of God cannot be changed. Satan tried then, back then in the garden, and he will continue to do so until the very end. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. As the girl, in our analogy of a woman and the mirror, so too the woman, in Revelation 17, hates what she sees and adorns herself to cover her imperfections with her own works and her own right of understanding. She finds this to be impossible and tries to destroy the law of God because of what she sees in it. John 3.20 For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh into the light, lest his deeds be reproved. But I say, fear not, friends, for we have a hero. We have the light of the world in our corner, do we not? Matthew one twenty one. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Remember back to Genesis 3.15? For Satan shall only bruise his heel. Jesus has already won the battle for us. He's already taken our place. Why shouldn't we believe in him? Let's get back to Babylon. That name is a derivative of Babel and the story concerning a tower in Genesis 10.10. In the building of this tower, God saw what man could accomplish without concern and regard for the moral law. For Satan shall only bruise his heel. Referring back to Revelation 17.5, and if you could bring that. Ah, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the Great, the Mother of Harlots and Abominations. And we just need to, fi- uh, to follow a few clues here. There is a worldwide church called the Mother Church. And I had a... Uh, there we go. Thank you very much, Charles. Referring back, yes... We just need to follow the clues. There is a worldwide church called the Mother Church, from which have come many churches to follow her doctrines of idolatry. She has attempted to change the law of God, and she has persecuted the saints of God. All these points, all these points out that the Roman Catholic system, it fits every description of the woman in Revelation 17. She is full of vanity and taking the name of the Lord in vain for gain. She has corrupted the world with a wine of confusion, a corrupted covenant. In some Catholic Bibles and catechisms, the law of God has been modified in a very special way. The second commandment has been removed, which prohibits the worship of idols. The fourth commandment, which exhorts us to worship God on the seventh day Sabbath, has also been altered. There we find a spurious Sabbath in its place. 
Interesting, isn't it? When you put the biblical commandments beside the Catholic tradition. They admit it. They're not hiding. The tradition of man is not hiding anywhere. It is right before us. Right before us. Remember, the reason for all this change is because this woman doesn't like God's mirror. She has tried to change it to fit her own desires, her own opinions, her own traditions, placing herself in the seat of God. We see that the papacy has attempted to change the law of God. The second commandment forbidding image worship has been deleted. And the fourth commandment has been changed as to authorize the observance of the first day rather than the seventh as the Sabbath. And papists urge us to believe that the second is redundant and is included already in the first commandment and is still valid as God designed it to be understood. The fourth commandment change exactly fulfills prophecy. For this is the only authority complained, claimed that it is that of the church. Here is the papal power openly setting itself above God. Daniel 7.25 And thinks to change times and laws. Second Thessalonians 2, 3 to 5. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there be a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, Jesus saith, I told you these things. We can't be blind. We're not blind, are we? We see, we hear, we comprehend. What should occupy our minds at all times is this, is how can I as an individual best reflect the image of God in my life? How can I look into the mirror and become a perfect reflection of Jesus? Where do we go to find the answer? The Bible. 2 Corinthians 3.18, But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory. Even as by the Spirit of the Lord, by beholding Jesus is how it is done. You do not have to alter the beauty that is already yours. The beauty that is, that, that is you. You don't have to change that. Because by beholding Jesus is how it is done. You do not have to alter the beauty which God has already given you. You don't have to add. You don't have to subtract or reshape. Because Jesus' character will do it all for you. Amen? Amen. We are all. So am I. We are all of us broken. By this life, we are imperfect and we are corrupt and we see our reflections by the mirror or by memory. Yes, we know what we have done. And we know where we have been. You can run, but friends, you cannot hide from yourselves. Make no mistake about it. That whatever it was, you bought it. And whatever it is, you're wearing it. 
You made your bed. And as my dear mother pointed out to me, now you can sleep in it too. Whatever it is, you can't change it on your own. You can't change it by yourself. You can't change it through your own power. The only person that can give you the power is who? You know it. Claim it. Not by your strength. Instead of worrying about it, instead of carrying at all that burdensome weight of guilt or remorse, I say, lay it on Jesus. He asked you for it, did he not? In this book, he said, give it to me. Put your burden on me. So place it daily before the throne. Get on your knees and put your burden right there before the throne. Matthew eleven twenty eight thirty, And Jesus says, Come unto me. He calls out, My yoke is easy. He claims my burden is light. He said, Learn of me. For I am meek and lowly of heart. Jesus is approachable, my friends. And you shall find rest for your souls. Can we get an amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your ears today. God bless you all. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, once again we humbly come before you and we thank you. We hear the message of the song, Heavenly Father. It must be the breaking of the day, Heavenly Father, and we ask that it come soon to take us all out of the darkness, Heavenly Father. We ask that you be with us in this coming week, Heavenly Father. Help us to stand. Help us to move forward, Heavenly Father. And please, please, Lord, put people in our paths that we may speak to, that we may give testimony to, Heavenly Father. Watch over us now as we move forward in this day, your holy Sabbath. In your son's holy name, Jesus Christ, amen.